Hey everybody, I'm Bob Baker with Jazz Guitar today, and we're talking with trumpeter, educator, podcaster, author, all-around cool guy, Dr. Gordon Vernick from Georgia State University. So you were saying something about trying to teach people a trumpet over Zoom. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's wonderful to be here, Bob. It's, a, uh, it's an honor to, to talk to you in this on this platform. Um, so Zoom and, and Skype don't work well for um, brass instruments because unless um, a student is using a very, very high quality microphone with all kinds of things to, to limit the sound of the, of the horn into a microphone, it can be a, a, just an absolute disaster. I have one student, his father um, owns a recording studio, so his, his sound is just perfect. But for most other people, <laughs> it's just, it's a nightmare. And I, I'm saying, please play that again. And then when they get up close to the microphone, it's just, it completely distorts because they're using like a $29, um, this is how old I am, Radio Shack microphone. <laughs> Radio Shack's been out of business for 15 years, but you know what I mean? So, um, I you know, during COVID, you know, it was, we had no choice. Um, and uh, in retrospect, I probably could have done some of those lessons, you know, if I'd been, you know, in, in a large room, but, you know, that was just what we had to put up with for, um, for over a year, but it, um, I really couldn't work on sound because that's right. the most important thing with any instrument, whether you're a guitarist or a trumpet player or a vocalist is, is sound. Everything is secondary to sound. So if I can't hear your sound, it is, uh, it makes it really difficult to be an effective <laughs> teacher. <laughs> well, in, in the, in the world of guitar, they refer to it as tone, you know, does he have tone or not have tone? Well, but, you have uh, a, you have a, a thing here. I wish I had one of those. Yeah. <laughs> pot it's like I turn it up and down and I just press buttons because my lips aren't working properly my sound is like really not that well focused <laughs> well well let me tell you why I wanted to talk to you today I got a couple of things uh that I wanted to to get into uh first of all let me just say this I wanted to thank you um for something on I think uh no one's asked me to do this but on behalf of uh the city of Atlanta, I know for a fact that you are by far the most influential person in jazz in Atlanta ever. You've taught so many people and you've led jam sessions the whole time, but even farther beyond that is the people you have taught, came, the people that came through your program are now the educators in other, other universities, other schools, other colleges. So the Gordon Vernick thing, <laughs> uh, you know, your your stamp is all over the Atlanta jazz scene. And it all, it's also obviously it goes further than that because all the guys that study with you, the play in bands that tour all over the world and all that. So without a doubt, um, your presence, your feeling, uh, your energy, uh, your body of work is is phenomenal with what you've meant to the world of jazz. And I, I personally wanted to thank you, but I think the city of Atlanta owes you a thank you for everything that you've done. Uh, that, that's very kind of you, of you, Bob. I think of myself not so much as a, as a teacher, but more of a mentor, but also as, a, as, as kind of a farmer. And what a farmer does is you start with really high quality seeds, um, good fertilizer, water, sun, and all these things, and, and you grow um, a crop. And for, for, for me here at Georgia State, for, for uh, someone who runs a program like this, our students are our crop and we, we try to help them to grow and so they can um, mature into, you know, self-sufficient, you know, quality musicians who are on a journey to find their own voice. And, you know, we got to pick out the weeds and not every crop is going to be um, great. Sometimes we have great years, sometimes we have a little bit of drought. Um, but over, you know, 30 plus years at Georgia State University, um, we've had more um, a very fruitful um, harvest th than years of drought. And um, a legacy for a teacher um, really are the students that you turn out. I'm not responsible for everyone's success, but I provide an environment and I hire really good teachers that I trust that I know will help mentor um, you know, students in the right direction. And, and it's, it, you're very true. You know, I, is what you said was very true. I have a lot of students, former students out there that um, have gone through our program, 
uh, maybe the whole program, maybe they were, they were in our middle school program, maybe they came out of our high school program, and decided to go to New York. But I've had a chance to um, to intersect with some amazing talent. And, and it really is is an important thing. And it's when I look back on the body of, of the work and the things that we, we have accomplished here, I, I don't do everything by myself. I have to surround myself with really, really good people, whether it's Dave Frackenpole, Kevin Bales, Robert Boone, um, is our drum set instructor, David Sanchez. These are people that are, are great um, teachers and mentors, and I just kind of turn them loose. And when it's time to make a, a, a system adjustment, I step in or we just talk about a specific student, what would best serve their needs, or maybe they're not a good fit for what we're trying to achieve. And that's that's always a difficult thing if a student comes in, they want they have an idea of what a jazz guitarist or jazz trumpet player is, and it really doesn't fit our agenda, then maybe we're not a good fit for that 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 particular student. But we try to accommodate all of them and and I, and I appreciate what you said. And uh, as I look back on, on a pretty long career, and I got a lot of good years ahead of me. <laughs> yes, you do. To, to keep to keep doing this, it 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 really is. Um, it's sometimes I have to, you know, kind of just pinch myself. And say, did, did I would did I really work with that student? Or I had a student, um, a very good guitarist, uh, Jeremy Wilms, who was in our program in ninety four and ninety five, and that goes back, you know, twenty five years. And he was in New York for many years, and he's relocated to Atlanta. His wife um, is a scientist, or she's she's doing something. She has a very good job, and they decided that New York was getting too expensive and whatever, and they relocated down here. And he sounds like a million bucks. And I would just, I was somebody said, "Who's that guitarist?" I said, "Well, he was a class of '95." And, and I started thinking, God, that's a long time ago. And he's got kids now, and they're grown up. Um, so that's, you know, what I, I always get kind of weird, weirded out when someone, I, when, when I see a student who's married and they have their kids, but when I see grandchildren, I go, oh my God, <laughs> I've been here that long. Well, well, if it makes you feel any better, when I was down there in 2013, 14 and 15, um, I was twice as old, wait a minute, I was twice as old as a lot of my teachers and three times as old as any of my other fellow students. Yeah, the students, yeah. <laughs> it, it's really kind of a funny thing. And, you know, we have a wonderful program called GSU 62, that uh -huh. if you're over 62 and you can get, if you are accepted into the university, you can pretty much take any classes that you like and it doesn't cost you anything. It's a wonderful program. That's so we great. have a lot of um, adult students who decide that they, want to come back and and uh you know sharpen up their skills or they just enter a program um a bachelor's or a master's program so it's it's a really um it's a really cool program so we have people that come back with you know incredible life skills and and, and business acumen who have also a lot to you know um to offer our 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 income our young students our traditional students the kids right out of high school well you know the interesting thing i'm gonna i'm gonna uh blow a little more smoke up your skirt here um you know if you read your you know your pr if you will um the places you've been the people you've played with the the things that you've done in terms of you know being a clinician and a teacher master classes literally all over the world i, I love the one the conservatory at bordeaux i think that's i think that, that, was, that, that was that was fantastic I, and the I wine the wine was just terrific how, how do you do better than that you know, I mean, I mean, I go, I look at all these other these other prestigious schools, and I'm going, well, that's nice, but I think the one I want to be at is the Conservatory of Bordeaux. And I, you know, when I, when I was an undergraduate in college, I was uh, a, a French major, and I was doing music as as a kind of a secondary um, a major, as as a minor. And after a semester of of um, language study. Um, I decided I, I didn't want to be a French major because I wanted to learn how to speak to improve my my conversational French. And what they were doing, they were teaching me how to read, you know, 18th century Moliere books, and I was not interested in that. So I I kind of left that. So when I when I did go to Bordeaux, and I with my broken French, which I what I can remember, I remember going to a coffee shop and having a real croissant, and then sitting out and having a cup of coffee, and I thought, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I should be paying these people for this experience. I, I, you know, I've been to France a couple of times, and I, I absolutely understand where you're coming from with that. But you know, the, the the traveling that I do all over the world, 
um, you know, music and is this is such a cliche. It is a language in itself. And I've been to you know the Far East, um, to Europe, South America, all over Asia, and um, but music speaks. So if I'm from somewhere, I remember being in a in a, uh, where I was in, in Bangkok and going to a jazz club, and there was a, a group playing there, and they were quite good. And a friend of mine said he knew someone, and they made the introduction. I said, uh, uh, "Dolphin dance, uh, C." And they all went like this, and we played it, and it was fantastic. No, no, no words were spoken. So, um, this this music, um, all music is a language, but jazz music, especially because you know it's it's so spontaneous, and you have to you know have such a deep knowledge of chords and scales and all these other things. Not only just knowing melodies. Not that I'm I'm I'm, I'm playing that part down, but it. it going all over the world and doing this is so easy, and and playing a trumpet is. You know, like my father was a professional musician in New York City, and he was my first mentor for, for better or for worse. But he said, you know, either you can play the instrument or you can't. And he was a, a bassist. And it always starts with, you know, good fundamentals. Can you can you play the instrument? Then you figure out what language you want to play, whether it's jazz, you want to be an orchestral player, you want to play modern avant-garde. They're all different. Um, like it's like cuisine. You know, you start with really good um, you know, basic, um, you know, foodstuffs, high quality fish, meat, vegetables, and then you decide, well, I'm going to do Asian, I'm going to do Middle Eastern, and then you just you add the spices. And that's kind of how music is. You start with really good fundamentals. Can you play your instrument? Um, and then that that's recognized around the world. So it's it's so easy and it's so much fun for me. And I can learn a few words in a, in a language and speak a little bit of a broken language. But most people don't even not even interested. I play the trumpet and say, this is what it sounds like. And that's a, that's a language in itself. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm going to uh, kind of echo what you're saying here. I mean, I've interviewed guys from Australia, people in Beijing, people in Norway, people in Italy, people in France, people in South America. I mean, literally all over the world. We've been doing this for five years. Um, and, you know, the, the the commonality is is the language, is the music. And, um, you know, sometimes the uh, sometimes speaking to these people is <laughs> a little bit broken, but but the commonality. So I, I I'm hearing what you're saying and I've actually, you know, lived, you know, lived that with these with these people. It, it, absolutely. Um, so. You know, another nice thing, and again, I, I, we still haven't gotten where I want to get to with the, with the thing I was going to ask you. Uh, but the other thing that I want people to know about you specifically is that you're still, you know, a lot of educators don't play or much. Um, it's, many of them do. Uh, I'm not going to sell, sell people short. There's a lot of guys that still are out there very active and growing. Um, but, you know, back in the day when I was when I was taking classes, I would be in the studio trying to figure out what the hell, you know, they wanted me to know. And I would hear you playing in your office. I hear you working on your chops in your office a lot. I mean, not just like once or twice. I mean, you practiced all the time uh, on your own. You know, it, it's the nice thing about music versus, you know, music is is a muscle memory skill, just like baseball, right. football or basketball. But the thing about music is that, even as your as your age, your body is aging, you can still get better at, at what it is you're trying to accomplish. You can still reach your goals. Where as your body, as you get older, th certain things break down. You can't quite, you know, throw a baseball or football or swing a golf club the way you did 30 years ago. But you can certainly do more things um, on your instrument, and and it just comes to you know consistent practicing and and i've been a lifelong pr practicer and and at one point in my life i i really wanted to just become to play the trumpet for a living and uh my, and my father was a musician in new york city and so back in the late 60s early 70s he said well what do you want to do i said i want to be a musician and he looked at me and he said you're not going to be able to do what what i did do for a living mm -hmm. and i thought he was saying that i wasn't a very good trumpet player and I was a pretty good trumpet player. I wasn't a great trumpet player, but I, I played well. And I was, you know, made all the all state, all what are those those things um, is, is my high school kids try out for. But what he was saying was the business right. of music was changing. Right. Uh, the kind of music that he played growing up, you know, in the 30s and 40s and 50s was more or less jazz based kind of music, you know, Sinatra, Basie, you know, that kind of stuff. Of course, rock and roll began to um 
move in and, and replace that kind of music. And today, of course, jazz has a very, very small part of the niche, but he could see the writing on the wall. And he said, you know, you might want to you know, think about maybe music education, but you can always play your trumpet. And the, and the thing that people used to say back then is say, you can always work your way through college. And and he was kind of right. right. I did play in bands and I did play in the cat skills for, um, uh, you know, uh, parts of seasons when I when I was able to get out of get out of school. But the business is just is changing. But I've always maintained a professional um, attitude about my art form, my, the way I play the instrument. So another thing about playing the trumpet is that, you know, if you make a mistake, everyone can hear it. It's such a directional instrument. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, my dad used to take me down to the union hall. Actually, um, it was it was like a clearinghouse for for jobs for musicians in New York City. And it used to take place every Wednesday at a place called the Roseland Ballroom, not the one from the 20s, a different one. And there would be hundreds, if not close to thousands of musicians in these little cliques everywhere. And you had your, your, your the guys did jazz recordings, studio people, the guys were playing ethnic music, the orchestral musicians, and they would go from group to group with a little date book and, and get their dates for the week or the month, whatever it was. And I remember I met a very famous trumpet player I didn't understand his his fame until much, many years later. And he said, oh, you play the trumpet. My father introduced me. And he says, well, I said, it's a good instrument, but it's something you got to be careful because he said, if you mistake, if you make a mistake, a big mistake, he said, everybody know. <laughs> that's and uh, that's the thing I, I really didn't need to hear as, as, a, as a 12 year old learning how to play the trumpet, <laughs> but you're just trying to fit in somewhere <laughs> and, and not make mistakes. And then so you're like, right, if I make one mistake, everyone's going to know. It's like being under a microscope. So uh, it is. But but that 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 work ethic has stayed with me to the point now where you know I'm here in my office and there's no one around here but I can go into a large pra um, rehearsal room get my horn out and I can practice my craft I play every Wednesday and I play other engagements I don't play as as many engagements as I used to but that's okay because um, I don't really want to I, I want to be able to pick and choose sure. the kinds of um, engagements where the music is the central focus because unfortunately a lot of music unless you go to hear the symphony especially popular music is more or less kind of a, a background been relegated to a kind of a background music we're having a party you want some nice music oh you want background music oh um i didn't oh, spend my life trying to learn how to play the trumpet so i can play background music while you're having cocktails. Um, I call it a wallpaper gig. Yeah, but if the, if the money's right, it's like, yeah, I'm there. Uh, <laughs> but, but but on the other hand, what I've been able to do with, with, with those kinds of requests is I, with my younger students, I, I know who I can, I, I can um, count on who, who I know or my students who are responsible enough. And I have confidence that if I say, there's an, there's an event they want a quartet and they're going to pay x amount of dollars and here's the information go play the job right and i said, and I, said I don't want to hear i don't want to get any phone calls from the client because if i do that means that something went right. wrong or right. it was so good they had to tell me something and then what i do is i'm, I'm also training them to learn um the professional aspects of, of the music business so now i have kids out there that are playing i don't have you know that are playing they're they're booking their own things they're playing at a you know um a little jazz thing here or a little coffee shop here or a brewer now the big thing is like sunday and saturday afternoon breweries are having live music and all these kids are all students of mine and they're all they have this they have a no they have a whole group of, of musicians um that are that they're hiring and i'm looking at them and um, every once in a while one of the kids will call me to see if i can sub for them it's like um, <laughs> I, yeah I, sometimes i'll do it just for fun just to, to get out of the house you know um, well let me let me tell you this you're talking about the business of music and not being able to you know your father telling you that you're not gonna be able to make a living so in 19 let me see in the year 2000 um let me see what year the hell was that 1970 1970 71 um i had just left a trio that i was playing in and i was playing i started playing in clubs and weren't anybody that would hire me basically and the number that i would get paid a night i started out at about 75 dollars a night five nights a week and then that moved to about a hundred dollars a night five nights a week and i did that for 15 years so until I was in my in my mid thirties, 
uh, early 30s, actually. And if you did a one-off, you would get between usually 250 to $400 to do a one-off. I mean, you know, that was back. This was in 1970 to 70, oh, three or four, you know, early, early. That money, you know, for inflation is almost 100 grand a year today. And I didn't do anything else but play. And most of the guys that I knew that were like me that were playing gigs, they didn't do anything else but play. And that's how we made our living. I bought a house, uh, had cars, and did the whole nine yards. I don't know anybody that's a gigging musician. I'm not talking about like a guy who's doing tours and, and the big act. You know, yeah. I mean, people are making that same kind of that exact not not the inflated number, but they're making the same amount, the same the same yeah. actual number today. I mean, I know guys that are doing gigs for fifty, sixty, seventy dollars. I yeah, mean, that, that's that's a, that's a, that's a real problem. Um, yeah. Because you have to, um, there's it, it comes down to a value system. People don't value music um, as much today as they did in, in previous generations, especially the kind of music that we play because of something called iTunes and Spotify and now right. where the music is so, you don't you don't place a value on something if you don't pay for it if it's free. Mm -hmm. That's why you can turn the faucet on and walk away. And and come back, you know, like you know, worry about it. I'm still. I'm, my parents were Depression era people, where you never walk, turn the faucet on, and walk in the other room because you'd get, you know, somebody would say something to you, and they were always checking the the thermostat. So because you had to pay for things, you put a value on it. If you if it's for if it's free, you there's no value system to it. Right. Um, and I'm I'm guilty of the same things. You know, I'll see, be in the car and I'm doing uh, thinking about uh, preparing a lecture and I need to listen to a specific Miles Davis recording made a red light and I'll type out say that Miles Davis whatever it is and the recording just pops up I didn't pay for it I mean I have a I'm paying my phone bill so indirectly someone's making money but the artist is not yeah. making any money so no. the, the incentive to to play and record has been changed and the in the playing field in my humble opinion has been decimated because of the 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 lack of value of of a product that you're trying to sell and you're putting your your blood sweat and tears in it and it's it's almost valueless in terms of a fiscal um approach but you know spiritually and musically it's it's luckily you know you don't you don't choose to be a musician music chooses you mm -hmm. so i i look at all these you know young musicians whether it's on youtube or instagram or whatever platform and i see unbelievable talent young people men and women it's no longer um the united states no longer has a monopoly and i there's a young uh woman i think she's in her early 20s her name is kelly hannah she plays the trumpet and she's just phenomenal and i just i love i subscribe to her um i think it's instagram or facebook i don't know what it is um, i still don't know how it works but it's <laughs> i found all these luckily there's there's still people doing it and it's it is very difficult to make a living doing this. Most of the very, the top musicians that I know all have um, some kind of relationship with an educational institution, whether yep. they're teaching part-time or they're artists in residence or they're full-time instructors. Most people have some kind of um, relationship with whether it's a public school, private school, conservatory, some kind of outreach program, people are writing grants. Um, there, there's no shortage of great musicians. What is a shortage of our venues that place monetary value on what an artist has to offer, and it's probably the same thing in all the performing arts. It's yeah. it's a real issue. Um, so uh, Johnny comes to me. And I'm just using a generic term, right. and he wants to be a jazz uh, saxophone player. And I sit down with him and his parents, and. Uh, and they'll say, um, what is Johnny going to do with this degree? And I'll say, um, it makes a great birdcage liner. <laughs> I don't say that anymore, but I remember saying that once. And it's true. It's just a piece of paper. It's what you do on the way to, to receiving that piece of paper that will either ensure your success or right. lack of success. And, and the reason people go to college, um, and I learned this a long time ago, and, and I always ask students, why do you go to college? And they say, to learn how to play the trumpet. You don't have to go to college to learn how to play the trumpet. Dizzy Gillespie didn't go to college. Um, Harry Glantz didn't, the great uh, trumpet player in New York, um, Phil, didn't go to college. He just, he took lessons, and when and when time is right, the teacher said, well, go audition for the, the symphony. 
Right. Um, so you can learn all these things on your own, but what you do learn in college is organization and responsibility. Right. And that's, for me, that's a key. And I maintain that. So you talk about, you heard me practicing is because I'm organized. I, I have to do this. I know I have a weakness here. And, and I guess an important part of become of being a good musician is to recognize what your strengths are, but more important, recognize what your weaknesses are and always practice towards your weakness. So I'm working on something that I don't do very well. And it's, it's, I'm sitting in my practice in my office and it's, I know it doesn't sound good. I'm cracking and fracking and the kids are walking by. I said, God, Dr. Vernick is having a hard day. It's because <laughs> I'm working on exactly what I should work on. Right. And um, I try to leave my ego at the door because every time you're in a practice room, you always want to sound really good because you don't know who's going to be walking by. I sound terrible so that when it comes time to go onto the bandstand or if I'm doing a performance or a workshop, that what I've been, my craft, I've been working on, whatever it is, I can execute it to a, a fairly high degree. Right. I I, I I absolutely hear you on that. And that's, uh, that's well uh, well articulated. So, okay, I think we, you're, you're kind of getting into something I want to talk to you about. People love lists. We know on the podcast and the, and the interviews and all that, they love lists. So I'm going to ask you a top five kind of thing. And um, I'd actually like to ask you two of them, but I'm going to start with this one. So, you know, you've probably been asked this question a million times by incoming freshmen, but top five things that you want these kids to know when they come through your program, when they when they when they leave the program, they've learned these things from you and your 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 guys and women, by the way. So what would you what would you what would you say that is? Uh, that's that's a really uh, that's a that's a very good question. There's so many things. Top five, I would say, is understand the jazz language. Um, it's it's a language, and you can't learn the language any language out of a book. You learn the language by hearing it and, and repeating it. So I want to make sure that when my students leave here, they have a really good grasp of how the language works. They can they can repeat it by rote as opposed by looking at the notes on the page and just trying to figure out um, I'm supposed to ac accentuate this this note or that note. So uh, um, jazz jazz phrasing they have to have a, a good concept of um, an understanding of jazz theory. Uh, for jazz musicians, you know, for all musicians, theory is really important. But for a jazz musician, because we are we are improvising, if your knowledge of theory is, is weak, it really affects you know what what you can play. Now there are there have been instances of great improvisers who really didn't know what they were doing, but they had such an innate sense of of, of melody and and, um, and and melodic comprehension they just played. So they have to have understand the language. They have to have a sense of theory. They have to be able to know the repertoire. There are young musicians that get out of college that know three songs. So you have to have repertoire. You have to have knowledge of theory. You have to know something about history. Not only just a music history, but um, uh, the history of the world, the history of this country, because that really feeds into the development of jazz as primarily as, as, a, as a totally African-American art form. It's been influenced by other music, other musics around the world, but you have to understand the history. If you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you're going. So that's four things. And right. then you have to be able to articulate what it is you're doing. So that's the teaching part. So when students leave here, if they can do those, have a good grasp of those four things, history of the music, history of how the music fits into the fabric of society, how the history of jazz music fits into the fabric of American society, how it's affected the world is really important. Understanding of music theory and how it affects what we do as musicians, repertoire, knowing some songs, um, and then, and of course, just the history of the music, knowing recordings. Um, you should have... If someone says, um, I name me 10 important Miles Davis tracks or whatever it is, you need to have that. And most and the kids that are most successful, they know that. And if I ask uh, someone who's a sophomore or junior, who's your favorite you know, jazz guitarist or incoming student? Um, who's your favorite jazz guitarist? And they they mumble and they and they just kind of fumble around and they'll mention something. I'll just say this is not a serious student. Right. 
by that time you by the time a student comes here as a freshman and they're pretty serious about their music they'll say um uh, pat martino pat metheny of west montgomery maybe if they study the old stuff it could be django reinhardt it could be oscar moore or um you know uh, joe bonamasso i don't care but <laughs> if the student knows that then i say they probably can figure out the other four things right and then and of course in the most important thing is that they're they're good human beings because nobody wants to be around someone who is unpleasant no matter how well they play um i i was asked you know in, in, when i bring in the, the most famous musicians in the world to do master class i always ask them a few questions and one of is is what's the most important a bit of advice you can i can you can give a young musician who wants to go to new york and they usually say something on the effect of humility know your limitations and be nice yeah that's um that's my 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 two commandments of how to succeed in business you've just said them it basically it's the same thing it's solve problems and try not to be an asshole i mean that yeah um that's, and that's, i i had a uh, got a years ago a great trombonist uh his name escapes me he played on a lot of the old cti recordings um and he did a master class for us. And he he said it in a in kind of a little more of a gruff way, but it and all the students were like, you know, because you know, generally in the South, um, you know, people here are are very, very um courteous and they wouldn't say that. And he was a real kind of gruff New Yorker. And he said, Don't be a you know what. Uh, um, nobody wants it, nobody we've got enough of them around, we don't need another one. <laughs> <laughs> so. well, I, I love it. Before we go, um I love your quote. Uh, I'm a, a, a mentor and a tormentor, something of that. that yeah, you, you you have to uh, you have to do both, and it's it's um, you know a really good teacher can zero in on a problem immediately, and a really good teacher zeroes in on a problem, but also has five solutions. Right. So that that's that's you just can't say that's wrong or that wasn't good you have to offer five solutions and then right. of course um say then go listen to this do practice this do this this and this and next week come back and see me and if a student does that i know they're on the way if they haven't done it then i know they're not very serious about it right so the, the tormenting part is um is just constantly reminding them that that old school thing and then of course um the, the mentoring is 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 kind of the the watering of, of the flower and right. then but you also have to pick out the weeds and pick off the dead leaves so uh you know it's 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 both both of those things as, as you just said i i you know i'm, I'm laughing i'm laughing to myself because um i recently did a reenactment of uh jk simmons role of terrence howard from whiplash and i was that guy you know speaking of tormentors uh did you see that movie yes i did what did you think of it well um it i had a lot of people come up to me and they 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 asked me about that because they said sometimes i'm like that in rehearsal i said i first of all i never raised a hand to a student but i've been um very very honest with a student that was should have been playing better um and i have lost my temper but i didn't think that was i think it was a little off the the over the top um and it didn't really help the the cause of um uh, jazz education and music education because right. most people just came away from that thinking that this guy was crazy but he did have high standards and he was trying to get the best out of his students but i don't particularly agree with the way that old school kind of um yeah. authoritarian tor uh, tormenting yeah. students so i i there were there were some great things about it and other, other things i thought oh my god this is this this might have set us back um a, a couple of years yeah it, you know there've been a lot of mu movies about music and jazz music and and I really haven't seen one that I really really liked although there was one that came out it was about Chet Baker's life but just a very very short period in his life in the right. 60s when he had his teeth knocked out I thought that was really well done and it really lent a lot of insight into um him as a as a human being and and as a musician I thought that was quite good but whiplash was um that was rough and i don't think it, i don't think it did us any favors no i mean i had to i had to be that guy i mean i was you know because i've been an actor now for the last three or four years 
I had to be that guy. And uh, I had to throw the chair and the whole nine yards. It was really interesting. Anyway, well, you know, I will tell you that um, uh, what I said early when we first started that, you know, city of Atlanta owes you um, a lot of thanks. And, uh, and the world of jazz owes you a lot of thanks for all that you've done. Uh, I mean that sincerely. Um, you know, uh, you know, it dawned on me, I don't know how many years ago, I've been saying this for a long time, by the way, it probably never gets to you, but uh, it dawned on me, I said, Geez, everybody in this freaking town is either studied with Gordon or is studied with somebody who studied with Gordon. I mean, it's like almost everybody. And I, and I said, you know, it's like, if you will, like Eric Clapton, you know, I mean, bottom line is, is that pentatonic blue scale that he plays at every rock and roll player for the last 40 years has played is, is a derivative of what he's done, you know? And so, um, but you, you've been, uh, you've been amazing and you're not done. You're still playing. I mean, not done at all. You're still playing well, every Wednesday night. You got your jazz jam at the red light cafe, people from out of town. If you come to Atlanta, go to the red light on Wednesday night. Um, you'll be welcomed in, bring your instrument or just come and hang. Uh, it's a great venue, great musicians. You got Kevin Bales still playing with you a lot, I'm sure. Yes, yeah. Kevin is um, uh, was supposed to play, but he has to be in South Carolina. So Randy Hexter is playing tomorrow. But love, you know, love I, I get really great, great musicians. You know, Ty Tyrone uh, Jackson plays um, sometimes. Lewis Haravo, um, uh, Kevin, and some really you know great, great guitar players come through. And sure. the thing about the jam session, just because you go doesn't mean you should play. Sometimes it's it's a great place to to There's learn some... repertoire. I have I have friends that come in that are they're close to my age, and they'll they'll take a they'll write down the name of every tune that we play. Yeah. They'll say What's that song you play there, and then they'll, they'll go home and learn. I do the same thing. So a lot of people come just to listen and to figure out what we're playing, and um and then when they feel that the time is right, especially with younger performers, um. Then I, you know, I always quiz them. Uh, you know, if it's, it's a singer coming in, and they'll say we want to sing such and such a song, I say, do you know a key? And they say no. I say, well, then you need to sit down because you're not ready to get them on the bandstand <laughs> and try to figure out because it's not, not my job to tell you or have a pianist, you know, play yeah. this and see. Here's the first the starting note. Then I know it's going to be a long session. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, I mean, your jam sessions where the big boys come to play. You know, I mean, for the most part, I mean, it's it's serious players. Um, you know, it's it's not the it's not a place to go as a beginner and you know. No, no, it's not. But we do have some incredibly talented, like you know, high school age kids that come oh, in. Yeah. Just I was like, oh my god, how, how did you learn that? And it's because they started at a very early age with, with harmony, language, yeah. repertoire, um, all these things, history, and 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 I can tell that they're already students of all these things. And they come in and they're 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 not fully formed, but they're really close to it. And, and you see kind of that, you know, you see that talent and you you um you know you nurture it, you encourage, you you do a great job, Gordon. You do a great job. I'm a big fan, if you haven't figured that well, out. Thank big, you, Bob. Big fan of what I you appreciate do. Appreciate that. So I think I'm done, unless there's something that you uh want to bring up about either your program or I know that you know what speaking of books, you wrote the the jazz history overview, which is really a textbook. Yes, we, we use that in our, in our history classes. We yeah. went from, you know, teaching, you know, 20 to 25 students a year in our jazz origins class to over 600 students, right. year, mostly in online classes. And that's sure. really, you know, it's, it's exploded. So we had to come up with a textbook that was, um, Jeff Hayden and I came up with that. And it was, we didn't want too much information because too much information is sometimes is almost as bad as bad information because right. then it's, you don't know how to separate what it is you need to know from all the peripheral stuff which is also important especially for someone who's not a musician you can't be throwing them names and concepts right. here's the basic stuff so we we just had to keep you know distill it down to some really basic concepts and that's done really well i've done podcasts i had a radio show for many years 2011 to 2016 i think yeah I th well actually we started about 2009 or oh, 2008 i'm sorry yeah we started oh, with okay. with jazz insights and yeah. uh, those podcasts are still floating around on on itunes and um at some point you know when the radio station closed uh closed down my incentive for creating a, a radio show every week kind of went along went away with it but um, I have created videos for our online classes. It's a funny, it's an anecdote I'll tell you with. 
So I created, you know, 20 of these videos from the music of Louis Armstrong all the way up to, you know, free jazz and fusion and Miles Davis and Pat Metheny and, and other things. And so I'm on the video talking. I have a nice green screen behind me and we have pictures and we play clips and we don't use videos, but we use all use audio clips. And I say at this point, we're going to stop. I want to play Miles Davis's recording of such and such from this second to this second. And so this is what the kids see, because when you're in an online class, you never see the professor. So I'm walking right. across campus and someone will say, hey, Dr. Vernon, come in your class. And I'm looking like, um, <laughs> what class is that? It's just the jazz <laughs> class. I said, I'm not teaching that. And then I realized that I'm the face of the class because they don't see the professor. Right. <laughs> they see me. So I say, I say thank you very much. Uh, yeah, the thank first you. time that I happened. I hope you're enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> that was that's funny so the, i'm the, I'm the face of it because i created the videos sure well if you buy my point to everybody out there watching and listening to this is that if you want to you know you want to do the deep dive uh it, jazz history overview uh is available i will say it's not cheap uh it's no that you know you can, you can buy use you can buy used copies on amazon is everyone yeah. does. now most kids are doing ebooks yep um, which is um, which is which is very convenient. I I if you, if you, you can see the, the books yeah. here, this is just this is my downstairs um, office. I have another office that has hundreds of books, and right. I just uh, I just collect books on on all, anything that interests me, especially about music and history. Sure, I'm not necessarily related. I'm really a big fan of of world and, and American history. I want to know why we are where we are, and if you peel back the layers and go, now I understand. It's, the history is like an onion. You know, it's peeling back layers. It's funny that you say that because for the last 15 years or so, I've that's what I've been doing. You know, studied the five great religions. You know, why do you know, I got started with it? Why do people around the world hate us so much? What did we do? You know, and I, this is what years ago I started, you know, diving into that. So, I mean, we, this is not the, the forum for that, but uh, I can relate to what you're saying. So, I spent a lot of time learning all the history and all the things that, that go on, at least I shouldn't say learning, I should say diving into it and, 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 and deeply, you know, and that it yeah, I, I, I understand completely because I have books up here. Um, uh, they're all about, about history, American history. Right. And, uh, you know, I want, I, I'm very, one of the things I, I guess my, my, one of the, my strongest suit is, is curiosity. Right. If you're not curious, I always ask my graduate students, what's the most important thing you bring to this class? And they'll go all kinds of, you know, kind of textbooks, answers, and I'll go, the most important thing you have is curiosity. If you're not curious, there's the door. Oh, just, man. Just I, go. I, I, man, I, I can't tell you how much that brings a smile to my face for you to say that. It's just, it's curiosity. Yeah. And, and I'm curious whether it's playing a trumpet or sitting here reading this or whatever it is yeah yeah no i listen uh you're preaching not only, you're not preaching to the choir you're preaching to a preacher uh, absolutely 100 percent. when i'm not doing nothing I'm, I'm on youtube watching the history channel and watching all these things how did that happen why did that happen who did this you know i get it i really get on all subjects it doesn't, doesn't matter anyway i'll probably edit all the, my superfluous crap out of this thing but I wanted to say thank you for coming on today. I really appreciate it. We did get your top five. I appreciate that. I appreciate all, all the things that you had to say. Thank you very much. So unless you got something else. No, no. Um, so I'll see you at the Red Light Cafe uh, Wednesday nights, 9 to 12. And uh, yeah, if you want to bring a horn or you want to sing, just make sure you're prepared. Yeah, that's it. So Bob Baker with Dr. Gordon Vernick. Thank you so much, Gordon. Really appreciate Absolutely, it. Absolutely, Bob. My pleasure. Right. Take, Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Safe travels.